So I figured I'd start out with the invisible gorilla. So picture yourself. You're going to watch a short video, OK? And in this video, there are going to be six people, three in white shirts, three in black shirts, and two basketballs. Your instructions as the viewer are to keep track of the number of times somebody in white passes the ball, OK? There's a lot of movement because it's a small space. So you're supposed to be silently keeping count. As these players move around and pass the balls to each other, and you're keeping track, a gorilla enters from the right. And this is a large, very hairy gorilla. Comes from the right, not unobtrusively behind the players, but right among them. In the middle, stops, looks at the camera, beats his chest, and then saunters off left. He's apparently on screen for about nine seconds. All right, so the question is, you've been keeping track of the passes. The gorilla comes by. Did you see the gorilla? In fact, the chances are better than even that you did not see the gorilla. And the people who did see the gorilla can't believe that you didn't see the gorilla. And if you didn't see the gorilla, you can't believe there was one. It must be some huge hoax. They show you the video again, but obviously this is a different gorilla. I'm uh, sorry, different video. So this, this was a wonderful piece of research. The thing went viral. How many of you know about this? Oh, OK. All right. Um, it's wonderful to watch. If you haven't seen it, Invisible Gorilla will we'll get it to you. And what it is, really, is this unusually entertaining bit from really a vast, vast literature on seeing and not seeing. And it helps with the rest of that literature to attest to the complexity and the contingency of visibility. So these are all findings that in some way or other complicate this relationship between the viewer and the viewed. As JC said, I have a sort of anomalous background in psychology and some related disciplines. My scholarly work is in philosophy of biology. And I suspect that I was recruited to speak here partly because of that background. But I'm not going to present my own work. And I'm not even going to be drawing on the parts of science that I know best. Still less am I going to try and give you a shapely scholarly argument. Instead, what I'm going to do is try to expand on the stream of consciousness that was my first response when Jean-Christian brought up this meeting to me. So what you're going to hear is a kind of riff, uh, a loosely connected, very loosely, I warn you, uh, connected uh, series of observations and thoughts. Uh, there may be some progression from the apparently straightforward to maybe more problematic and odd. Um, but part of the point, and I think part of the point of other people at this meeting, is that even what seems simple and straightforward isn't. Science certainly does have lots of examples of devices and wonderful methods for rendering visible what was formerly invisible. Invisible maybe because of distance, because of size, because of speed, and so on. So you have telescopes that can scan the heavens and reveal these hitherto unknown objects and processes. Uh, if you have not yet seen the newest Hubble telescope images, for God's sake, see them. They are just phenomenal. They are phenomenal. 
At the other end of the spectrum, you have microscopes that these days allow children, in the normal course of their education, to peer down at these microscopic amoebae or paramecia. This is quite miraculous. But notice that those devices and devices like them don't just increase the number of things to look at. So think about the telescope again. It transforms our sense of the world. And in fact, our world simply becomes one among many others. And most of these others are now glimpsed across unimaginable distances. And therefore, across unimaginable spans of time as well. A telescope then becomes a vehicle for time travel. It brings into view events of millions of years in the past, making even our own geological history seem absolutely evanescent in comparison. So contrary to what was suggested earlier, sometimes the past is visible in the present. In like manner, if you look through a microscope, you have the universe of the visible enlarged for you. At the same time, this, this instrument is reworking your place in that universe. So eventually you may find your own body, or your own cells, becoming more like multi-level ecosystems than like unitary individuals. In fact, on this idea of getting transformed by what we see, we're often told about these scientific advances that have inflicted repeated trauma to human self-regard, these progressive diminishments as geocentrism and then heliocentrism have been abandoned. These are, in a way, ex existential humiliations. And you can wonder whether something of the sort is at work today as people resolutely deny and resist evolutionary theory, for example. There's a lot of wounded pride around. Now, there's one woman I'm thinking about. Her name was Lynn Margulis. She died a couple of years ago. She would have had nothing to do with such denial, among other things. She worked on microbial symbiosis and the evolution of the cell. Now, people often regard cells as mere bags of DNA. But that, of course, is a travesty. It's a real cartoon. It's born of the romance that we have, we scientists but also lay people, romance with the gene. If you look at them, these cells are veritable factories. There's frantic traffic in and out this little membrane, inside, all around them. The cells are virtual factories, constantly building, maintaining, breaking down, metabolizing. And a lot of this work is done by organelles, which are even tinier structures inside these cells, without which the cells, and thus you and I, wouldn't exist. Lynn argued in her talk that certain of these organelles, many with their own DNA, their own replication cycles, were formerly free-living microbes, little single-celled organisms that interacted repeatedly over evolutionary time, often in predatory or antagonistic uh, relations, eventually forming symbiotic relations until, and this is many, 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 many years, until eventually some took up permanent residence with others, even inside them, and eventually became part of the permanent, obligate machinery of nucleated cells. So if you look in a cell and you see all these little things that are doing all the work, her argument, along with many others, um, is that those are the results of a long history of incorporation, of hiding out inside each other, of cooperation, of antagonism. 
In endosymbiosis, then, these myriad little beings are no longer swimming and floating free in some primordial ocean, but they've become constitutive, vital parts of our cells, while billions of other cells, other uh, microbes, are swarming in our guts, digesting our food for us, synthesizing vitamins, synthesizing nutrients, still others, by the billions, are all over us, in us, in our business. <laughs> they are everywhere. In fact, they uniquely constitute us. And they vastly outnumber, vastly, our human selves. At the end of this marvelous talk, Margulis invited us to re-envision ourselves and each other as clouds of these teeming populations of multiply nested hordes of microbes. <laughs> we stared at each other. Some were probably aghast, and others, like me, were completely enchanted virtually dematerializing as we saw each other dissolve into these swirling legions until it was no longer some colleague looking back, but a multitudinous they. Looking is a mode of acting, or rather interacting with the world. And there's a certain mutuality to it. As our conference introduction suggested, what's seen depends on who's looking, how, why, and in what circumstances. And seeing affects the seer, neurochemically, emotionally, intellectually, even morally, for a second, for a month, or forever. And thus, those changes are influencing the world that looks back. There's a beautiful phrase that I've always loved. It comes from psychologists Eleanor and James Gibson, for whom perceptual learning was the education of attention. So, learning to walk, as my other grandchild, uh, is about to embark on, um, learning to drive a car, learning to appreciate wine or make art, it typically requires us to notice more and different aspects of some object or of some action. Often, it makes, uh, we're asked to make finer and fire, finer discriminations, so things become differentiated that were not before but it also means learning what to ignore. So, consider, active looking and selective attention are absolutely crucial to that gorilla's vanishing. If you're not following the instructions, there's no problem seeing this gorilla. <laughs> he is unavoidable. But there are also more subtle senses of visibility and invisibility. So, when you were a child, perhaps you had the experience of being in your dark bedroom and staring in terror at the boogeyman that was hunched menacingly in the corner, too scared to move, and you look and you look, wondering when it's going to come and get you. And if you're lucky, and you keep looking, maybe it'll resolve into a pile of clothes that were slung over your chair. Or something that happens to me constantly. Um, you're given a photo, and you can't read it. You look at it, <laughs> you look at it, and you don't know what it is, until suddenly something becomes visible. Or rather, since the surface of the photo was always visible in some sense, something appears. It's look atable. That is, something looks back. 
I love these moments. They are deeply, deeply mysterious to me. The stimulus hasn't changed, and then everything changes. Then there's this. If you view your reflection, your own face, in a mirror, under particular dimly lit conditions, you will probably see your face change in quite odd and sometimes very alarming ways. You may see your face become the face of another person. And that person may be known to you, may not be. There may be alterations in what you know, there may not be. But sometimes your face becomes that of a monster, or some strange animal, or it disappears. Uh, I caught in my um, desperate listening with the French this morning this beautiful phrase, the fragility of the visible, and that seems to apply here. What could be more st stable and knowable than your own face? And yet this too is fugitive. Maybe even more confounding in certain ways is something called blind sight. Does anybody know about blind sight? This is so weird. This is a kind of blindness that's related to certain lesions in the visual aspects of the brain. So although superficially it might look like hysterical blindness, it seems quite a different phenomenon. The person feels blind, is not conscious of seeing anything. And yet, there are ways, if you're clever enough, of showing effective vision of some kind. For example, if you ask a patient with this kind of uh, condition to describe something or to make a decision about some stimulus, you'll be told, well, that's, that's a stupid request because, of course, I can't see. But if instead you ask the person just to make a guess, take a wild guess about whether it's say this or that, the guess will be well over chance. You can watch, again online if you look, a video of a man with, uh, with blind sight. And he's had his cane taken away from him, and he's told to walk through this space, which is empty. He's told that it's empty. What he doesn't know is that this space is full of obstacles piece of furniture, a box, an object here, and you watch this man slowly, somewhat hesitantly, walk through this space, and he avoids every obstacle. He doesn't hit a single one. He is completely unaware of having done this. What he's aware of is that he walked blind and trusting through an empty space. Now, that raises a lot of questions, but one that's salient for me, at least in this context, is that it calls into profound question who it is that sees. Who's the seeing agent in this situation? Now, these are tidbits from the literature. They may seem somewhat esoteric to some. So if you're in that class, you may be relieved. We can turn back to the everyday world. We can ask, for example, about the relations between viewers and the persons viewed in the string of killings in urban US in the last several years, the ones that have gotten so much attention. They often involve an unarmed, fleeing, or even surrendering black male. You can think of Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old Cle uh, Cleveland boy who was playing alone with a toy gun in the park. It was a gun that was initially reported twice as probably fake. But then there was a chain of seeing and hearing and telling and acting 
that included the 911 caller, the police dispatcher, policemen arriving at the scene, and one of them uh, later reporting the incident. And in that chain, this pre-adolescent, this Tamir, had morphed into a man aged probably 20, wielding a gun in a manner that was so threatening that he was shot within seconds of the policeman's arrival. What looks back at an officer in a situation like this? You could say that the victims of these kinds of killings aren't visible. That is, that they're not recognized as full members of civil society. If you heard or read about the protesters' chant, or you've seen the t-shirts, it's every place now, the chant is Black Lives Matter. At the same time, there's a kind of hyper-visibility that's at play here. It's rooted in decades of animosity, of violence, of anger, of cynicism, of resentment, of mistrust, and fear. I'm going to reach into the research again to try to add another dimension to this rather deadly brew that we've got. Not, I hope, to exculpate, but maybe to uncover some of the stubborn complexity of the tragic mess that we're in and that we seem doomed to reduplicate and recreate. So here's an experiment. Subjects witness a somewhat ambiguous staged shove. These subjects describe the shove as more violent when the actor was black than when the actor was white. In another study, black men were perceived as larger than similarly built whites. Meanwhile, Think about this in contrast to this storm of coverage of these shootings of boys and men. Do you realize we hear very little about the large numbers of women of color who are similarly shot in similar conditions? Not to mention the possibly hundreds of thousands of rape kits painstakingly collected, piled on shelves for years. These kits that hold potential evidence, they're never seen because nobody ever looks at them. So it seems that we have degrees of invisibility, uh, invisibility even within disregarded populations. Now, a long time ago, I went to an exhibit in which I faced an old photograph of a lynching in the American South. Lynchings, of course, are these, it's an American habit. It's essentially an extrajudicial killing, a mob killing, uh, very often accompanied by mutilation and torture. And like most Americans, I had seen these images. You could say it shouldn't be possible to see one of these photographs without screaming. It shouldn't be possible, no matter how many of them you've seen. But I didn't. I didn't scream, I didn't rage. As I looked at this horribly familiar scene, there's the branched tree, there's the crowd, some of them turning, grinning to the camera. And then I glanced at the wall label. And I was shocked as these sudden tears burned my eyes. The label had given this man's name. And what looked back then was suddenly not a body, but a person. Now, of course, the dead 
don't look back in the usual sense. Indeed, part of the point of a lynching must be to destroy the possibility of an answering gaze, to create pure spectacle, to create pure not me. Now that memory, I think as you can probably tell, <laughs> haunts me. I've told this story many times. I wasn't sure I wanted to tell it here. But in thinking about whether to tell it, it occurred to me that there was more in that exchange between the photo and me besides the restoration of personhood to a dead man. I think there was accusation as well. And that those tears weren't just of anguish and fury, but they were of shame. And that that's why I can't escape them. It's shame that I'd had to be jolted into fellow feeling. That it had taken a name tag to bring that dead man back across the barrier into visibility as a human being. So think for a moment about that word, visible. It's in the conference title. It's an adjective. Adjectives, we're told, describe nouns, things, rather than things in relations. So despite the sophisticated tenor of this meeting, the subtlety of the things that have been talked about, the title doesn't really position us very well to deal with many of these phenomena. In like manner, my own trope of the world looking back could endorse the notion of objects that are clearly separate and distinct from subjects. That, it, as opposed to me, mine, and ours. And yet, I think you've heard that my comments are framed by a view of organism and environment relations as rather systemically entangled, as mutually constituting, as not independent at all. We labor under a disadvantage. It really doesn't help that there's a kind of poverty of expressive means when we try and talk about these things. But on the other hand, I'm the one who set up this tension by choosing that title for my talk. The world looks back. So in a way, this brings us back to Lynn Margulis's talk and her exercise, this exercise that she set us, of shifting our vision from ourselves and others as cleanly bounded individuals to clouds of invisibly interconnected lives. In recent years, you've probably noticed, there's been an explosion of research on that microbial world that she studied. We hear about our microbiome, our microbiota, all these little critters in and on us. And particularly with reference to health. Indeed, our survival and identity as organisms depends crucially on these little mites. If you read the popular press or scientific literature, the reports will often mention the tiny proportion of the total DNA in our bodies that's ours. Now, the estimates of these numbers vary wildly, as you can imagine, but microbial cells clearly vastly outnumber our own. Now, so far, I've followed these linguistic conventions, but you've seen my fingers wiggling, you know, to distance myself from these pronouns. Because I want to ask, now, among these shimmering clouds, which cells, which parts of cells, which little bits of DNA are human DNA, are our DNA, and which are them? 
After all, conglomerations are what human cells and bodies are. So, given our inability to live without them, who or what is the agent that can see those trillions of beings as exterior to ourselves, as not us, as not me? In fact, it seems that running through all of these musings on attention, on reciprocal effects of seer and seen on each other, on individuality and on multiplicity, on hypervisibility, as well as annihilating invisibility and otherness, there are some persistent puzzles. When I say, we look, and the world looks back, who's the we that looks in the first place? And given organisms' entwinement with their living and their non-living environments, who's the they? Who's the not me who might or might not look back?